session, where today we are exploring the Oceania region. Live, Zoe. Pardon? Go ahead now. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our Explore session today. We are exploring the Oceania region, and we're learning about these countries, what exploring them means, and what it is like to study there. Um, just a reminder, each week we do explore different regions and next week we will be exploring the Global South and what it means to explore Argentina, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Mississippi, Ghana and India. Also next week we do have our study abroad fair coming up November 3rd to November 5th. Um, throughout the week we'll be, we will be having many events for some general information on study abroad, drop-in panels, talk shows, and you can find out more about the study abroad fair on the CIP website. So just a couple housekeeping items before we begin. We are doing Microsoft Live Teams, so therefore to all of our attendees, you cannot use your audio or your video function, but you can ask questions in the Q&A chat function or add some comments throughout the presentation, and we will be answering them. And we will be here until 3.30 today. And at the end of the presentation, we will be having more contact information if you would like to follow up about anything. And if you need to leave the presentation early or if you missed one of our previous presentations, the session. All right, so let's get started. My name is Zoe and I am a peer helper at the Center for International Programs. I studied last winter at the University of Tasmania in Australia, and I'm currently in my fourth year studying psychology. Also with me, uh, we have a past study abroad participant. Her name is Emily, and I will let her. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, so this last winter, I was studying at Lincoln University in New Zealand, and I'm studying landscape architecture, and I'm also in my fourth year. So today's presentation will be landing in New Zealand, Australia, and Fiji. All right, so let's take off. Um, our first stop of the day is New Zealand. So what it means to be exploring New Zealand is that you can visit um, Araki, Mount Cook. It is the highest mountain in New Zealand. It is listed at 12,218 feet. There are many hikes and short walks that are well-formed. There's glacier viewing, mountaineering, and lots of skiing that you can do. You may also be there during Anzac Day, which falls on April 25th. It is a public holiday in New Zealand and Australia, and it commemorates New Zealanders and Australians who passed away in war and honor those who have returned. Also in New Zealand, you may be able to try some Hokey Pokey ice cream. It is a creamy vanilla ice cream with pieces of honeycomb toffee. It has been a flavor favorite since 1953 when it was created. Um, Emily, when you were in New Zealand, were you able to try any different types of food over there? Yeah, so I was able to try Hokey Pokey ice cream and they also had Hokey Pokey chocolate. So it was just the honeycomb bits and chocolate, which was really good. Um, pineapple lumps was one of the candies that I was able to try as well. Um, it tastes more like banana flavored Laffy Taffy covered in chocolate, um, but they call it pineapple lumps. Um, so that was pretty neat to try. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite part of the culture of um, New Zealand? Um, I just love the people. Everyone I met was super friendly and just like willing to help you. Um, you might have to go up and like talk to someone and ask for directions or help, but they were all super friendly and like they would make sure to help you. And it was just like overall, I felt very safe and they're just super, super great people there. Yeah, it's awesome. I know I felt the same in Australia. I really loved the culture. It was so welcoming. Um, yeah. Everyone was so nice and willing to help out, um, especially yeah. if I didn't know where I was going, if I needed clarification on anything. So that was really nice moving away to the other side of the world and still feeling comfortable. For sure. All right, and so our next stop of the day is going to be Australia. 
So exploring Australia means that you will be able to try some Vegemite. It is a food spread that has a strong and unique flavor and typically people enjoy it um, with a small amount spread on buttered toast. I personally love Vegemite, but there's also some people who strongly disagree with me. Um, so you might like it, you might not, but it's definitely a staple in a lot of Australian houses. Also, the world's largest coral reef system stretches over 2,300 kilometers off the coast of Queensland, Australia. I'm sure you know it as the Great Barrier Reef. the last stop of road trips that I did while I was over there and I have to say this place is absolutely gorgeous. There's so many trails that you can do. We were supposed to be camping but it got pretty cold so we, so we switched off to a cabin. Um, there's also a lot of wildlife you can see here. This is where I saw my first wombat and I saw maybe 20 echidnas over there so it's absolutely amazing experience at Cradle Mountain that's for sure. All right, and so our last stop of the day is going to be Fiji. So exploring Fiji means that you can try some fish lolo. It is a classic Fijian dish prepared by simmering meaty white fish in lolo, um, which is coconut milk, and it's garnished with tomatoes, onion, and ginger. If you are interested in trying some um, cultural dishes before you go abroad or when you're interested, um, if you go to the CIP website, we do have some food and recipes that you can try. And there's also a recipe for steamed Lolo buns, if you would like to give that a try. You can also visit Garden of the Sleeping Giant. There's 2,000 types of orchids, many native plants in a tranquil setting with, path, with paths and picnic areas. So it could be a nice way to spend some time walking around in nature. And you can also visit Sri Siva Sabramuniya Temple. It is the largest Hindu temple in the Southern Hemisphere. You can visit and explore its architecture and join the lively Hindu festivals there. So now that we've talked about what it means to explore these areas, you're probably wondering what is it like to actually study here? A lot. Um, majority of the classes there um, will be taught in English, um, but there is some different language slangs. Um, in Fiji, bula means hello, and in New Zealand, kia ora is hello. Um, so Emily, did you learn any of the language or any of the slang before you left? Is there any words that mean something different in New Zealand than they would here? Um, yeah, so there's a bit of slang and like different words. A lot of it more I picked up while I was there. Um, but there was this one YouTube channel that I found was really helpful to watch. Um, as in New Zealand, they use the alphabet a little differently. There's some letters that they don't use. And sometimes when different letters are together, they're pronounced differently. So like WH together instead of like WA here, it's like pronounced as an F there. Um, so some of the Maori names are quite difficult to say if you're not prepared because some of the arrangements are pronounced differently. Yeah, I know um, when I got to Australia, I learned that there is a lot of slang there and some of it I wasn't familiar with. Um, they say good day a lot for hello, but they also refer to the afternoon as Arvo. Um, they refer to bathing suits as togs. Um, they say snags or sausages. Um, fair dinkum, it means fair enough. Um, they also refer to in McDonald's as maccas. So there's definitely lots of different words and everything um, that have different meanings. So it could be helpful if you look up different slang terms before you go. And the currency exchange. So we created this PowerPoint um, with the current currency exchanges, but those can change every single day. So definitely keep track of those. But $1 Canadian can be roughly $1.07 in Australian, $1.14 in New Zealand dollars, or $1.63 in Fijian dollars. And so just to put this in perspective, a cup of coffee could be $4.25 in New Zealand, $3.96 in Australian, or $5.81 in Fiji.
So just to put it in perspective, the cost of living compared to Canada, it would be cheaper in Fiji, but rent would be highest in New Zealand and Australia. So Emily, what was the cost of living like for you when you were living in New Zealand? Did you find like it was more expensive? There were some things that cost more than they would here? Yeah, for sure. So when I was living there, I was on campus in residence, um, but I was in the apartment style, which was the cheaper because you were cooking for yourself. Um, like personal hygiene stuff like deodorant and shampoo was a lot more expensive there than it is here. Um, and food was a little bit more expensive. Um, so overall, it was a little more costly, but again, the Canadian dollar was a little bit stronger, so it wasn't too crazy. Yeah, living in Australia, I found that personal hygiene products were a bit more expensive and I didn't really bring too many of those with me in my suitcase just because of the weight limit. Um, like you, I did live on campus in an apartment building as well. Than if I had lived off campus, but Emily, what do you think the benefits of living on campus could be? Was there like events you could attend? Did that help you make new friends? Yeah, um, so where I was on campus, it was basically all international students. So it was a really great experience because that helped me meet so many other exchange students. Um, there was a lot from the States, but because we were all like living within that community, it kind of felt like summer camp and we were all in our own cabins. Um, and you'd just like go up to a different flat and be like, oh, hey, what are you guys up to? Or um, just like go chat. We played a lot of Frisbee, so um, we started a group chat and we'd go and do that. So it was really beneficial because you were able to meet other people who were like in your classes and just other exchange students that had the same interests in traveling and exploring the country like you did. Yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about living on campus is that there was lots of events I could attend and I met lots of other international students and I also got to know some local and like domestic students. Um, and I was also close enough to campus that I could attend the events that they had there. So that was, um, although living on campus did cost a bit more for me, um, it was it worth it in the end. All right, and scholarships for this region. Um, as a GWAL student, you are able to apply for travel bursaries and scholarships, but also you are still eligible for OSAP because you are still registered in an Ontario university. Um, so that's really helpful. You don't have to be paying um, all the international fees because you pay the University of Guelph your tuition. And the credit system. So 2.5 credits is the full time study at the University of Guelph. And this is equivalent to 40 USP credits in Fiji, 60 credits in New Zealand and 12 units in Australia. Um, in Australia, they do call courses units. This is something to keep in mind when you are doing your course selection. I know I was struggling to find courses for a while because I didn't realize that there's a different term for it. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind, but each course can have different weights. It all depends on how long the course is or um, what you need to do for it. So when you do your course selection, you will see um, how much each course is worth and then how it will transfer back. And the semester dates. Semester one in the Oceania regions is February to June, which is the winter semester here at U of Guelph. And semester two runs from July to November, which is the fall semester here. All right, and if you would like to find out more, you can go to the uofguelph.ca slash CIP website, and you can go to the study abroad program search. And here you can search for programs and apply filters to your field of study, what semester you would like to go on, um, a language of instruction if you want English or another language that you are fluent in, um, a specific country or region. And then when you do that, you will find that each partner university has its own page with their semester dates, the programs offered, a link to the host website, information and much more. Um, so through this program search is how I found a lot of my information while researching. You can go directly to the host website from here and you can find lots of information on these pages. All right, so some of our partner universities um, in New Zealand, we have Lincoln University and the Institute of Technology Unitech.
And, and we have quite a few partners in Australia. We have the University of Adelaide, Australian National University, Curtin, Edith Cowan, Victoria University, Griffith, Queensland University, University of Canberra, RMIT, the University of Sydney, Deakin, La Trobe, and University of Tasmania, which is where I went. Our um, now we're asking um, what I'd like to study there. Um, we can get a student's perspective from Emily. Add in the chat as well. Please feel free to send them through. Um, so just to get started, Emily, what made you apply for a abroad? Um, I really liked the idea of being able to go and live in a country for like a couple months at a time. So to be really immersed in the culture and have that experience. Um, I figure like once I get out into the profes professional world and start working, it's going to be a lot more difficult to go and live in New Zealand for five months um, and completely change my life. So it was great that it was built into my program to be able to go abroad and have that time built in. So that was a, a big push to do that for me. Um, just to be immersed in the culture and be able to explore the country. Yeah, so what drew you to that country or like to that culture? Like what made you want to um, go to New Zealand? Um, I've always just like had New Zealand kind of in the back of my mind, as weird as that sounds. Um, just whatever I see of it or see other people traveling or talking about New Zealand, it's always like, oh, that's so cool. Like I'm going to go there one day. Um, also, like when you watch the movies like Lord of the Rings or um, Narnia, some of Narnia's filmed in New Zealand. So to see just like the amazing scenery, um, as well as I love camping. And so that's a huge thing in New Zealand is all the camping and hikes um, or tramping, as they call it. Um, so to be able to just do that on the weekends and my friends and I, we just pile into a car and drive off somewhere and go camp for the weekend. It was just really amazing to have that opportunity and be able to integrate that in with my schooling. Yeah. So how easy was it for you to travel around New Zealand? Like, did you rent, was there public transport available? So there was the bus system, but the bus isn't like super reliable. Um, like it's always going, but it has specific times basically. Um, it's not as frequent as like here in Guelph is. Um, so I was with my friends who rented a car. A lot of people will buy older cars in New Zealand. Um, that's a big thing is like travelers will come buy a car and then they'll sell it before they leave. So you can generally like purchase a car um, because it's so mountainous. Um, it's not very direct to get places because you've got to travel all around like the winding mountains. So it is difficult to get places. So a car is highly recommended. Um, so like my friends, they rented a car and then we were just pitching in and we'd always split gas. So it was a lot cheaper that way and more manageable. Yeah, so we're in Tasmania. We had um, the bus system as well, but they're not always the most reliable. Um, but there was a bus station right near campus, so we could easily hop on right after school and go closer into the city. We could um, bus to one of the mountains away to go do some walking tracks. Um, and then like you, um, me and my friends, we did split gas money anywhere that we went. Personally, um, I didn't rent a car with anyone. Most of my friends that were domestic students there, they had a car, but we did just split gas money when we would plan to go somewhere. Um, so it was pretty good that we had that option. Um, but you mentioning that you like to do camping and that you'd want to travel around New Zealand. Have you done much traveling before or but with yourself or with others? So I'd never done any solo traveling before, so this is a first and especially going to the other side of the world, it was a little daunting, um, but I had traveled around a bit like the States and stuff with my family. Um, so I had some experience, but like I said, like being on campus, I met a bunch of other international students. So we were all same, same idea, same desire to want to travel around and explore. So it was great just to like get a group of students that all wanted to do the same thing. And it was really easy. We were like, OK, this weekend we're going to Kaikoura and then we could basically just go plan it a few days ahead, book anything we really needed and then just find a campsite somewhere and set up for the weekend. Yeah, um, like you, I've never traveled solo before. I had either traveled with friends on, on planes or with my family. So my first big flight alone with many layovers was very far and very long. Um, so when you were accepted and you knew that you were going to be traveling solo for the first time, how did you plan um, to go abroad? Like, was there anything that you were concerned about that you had to 
um, plan in advance at all? Um, so my parents were a huge help with uh, the whole process of my flights and everything. Um, my dad's an air traffic controller, so he kind of has a little leg up on the average person with the flights, um, and he really wanted to make sure I was routed through Canada as much as possible. Um, so like I flew out from Toronto to BC and then straight from BC to Auckland and then Auckland to Christchurch. And then he tried to make sure that I was flying at decent hours so I'd get in at like, I think I got in at like 8.30 in the morning or something like that to Christchurch. So I wasn't getting in at like the middle of the night and then trying to figure out getting from there to the school. Um, also, I kept in contact with my school and they actually picked me up from the airport and drove me to campus. Um, so that was great that that was something that the school offered, so I didn't have to worry about that. Yeah, I know um, when I was talking to my parents about it, one of my mom's biggest concerns was when I got to the airport in Tasmania, how would I get to the school? Mm -hmm. And um, University of Tasmania, they did offer to pick me up and then shuttle me to my accommodation. Um, so that's definitely really helpful. A lot of um, host universities do offer that, but there's also, you can also cab, you can Uber. Um, but I also just think um, talking with your parents about studying abroad is definitely really important. Were they supportive with it at first or how did you educate them on where you were going? <laughs> yeah, um, so within the landscape architecture program, it's built in to do internship or exchange third year. Um, so since first year, we've kind of been talking about this um, and then I've been talking about I wanted New Zealand. So my parents weren't really surprised and especially like I was like, oh, I applied today and they're like, oh, OK, great. They were more surprised when I actually accepted it. Um, they weren't sure I'd be able to follow through with it, but I was set on it. I was very determined I was going to do this. So I really surprised everyone with actually following through with it. But my parents were really supportive and it was something that we'd been planning for a while. So that definitely helped with the process as well. Yeah, definitely talking it over with your parents. Um, it can be a bit of a, a nerve wracking conversation at first because I had been wanting to go to Australia since I was like 15. So I told my mom, I was like, oh, I applied today. And then she's like, oh, yeah. And then when I got my acceptance letter, I called her and she's like, what is that? And I was like, oh, I got accepted. She's like, oh, like you actually got in. I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, so, yeah, definitely having their support. Um, and then I remember I laid out all the phone numbers for my mom, anyone she could contact. Um, if she had questions or if she wasn't able to get a hold of me, she had um, a lot of my paperwork at home and anything that might need to be done while I was away. Um, so it's definitely really beneficial to talk to your parents about it. I definitely agree with that. Um, so going from Canada to New Zealand, was there any like very big cultural differences? Did you experience any culture shock? Um, I don't really think so. There's nothing that was like huge. Um, like I said, everyone was super nice and really friendly. So it was kind of that like the stereotypical when you think of Canada, everyone's super friendly and willing to help you. It was very similar there. Um, so I was really fortunate that way. And then because I was with a bunch of other exchange students, we were all able to like support each other and uh, mm -hmm. figure it out together. Um, so it was really great to have that group of people with me as well. Um, it helped because like they were coming from the States too. So it was very similar ideas that we were bringing forward. Um, but it was just, yeah, there was nothing like huge than like jumping out at me right now. Yeah, I know what you mean, um, especially with people, um, they kind of have like the stereotype with being Canadians, like we're always really nice and um, really helpful and everything. I didn't feel too much of a culture shock in Australia. Um, but so how do you think your exchange prepared you for your future? Like, do you think this will benefit you in your career and any further studies? Oh, for sure. Um, it's a big, it was a big confidence thing for me. Um, I was really nervous about being on my own for five months on the other side of the world. So it was really just um, reassuring that I was able to do it. I was able to get through it, um, that I, I can do things on like completely on my own without having like my parents like half an hour away if I really needed them. Um, and then I was able to take landscape architecture courses while I was there. Um, so just getting that different um, education with the same um, 
same basis, it was really helpful. And I'll be able to talk about that in any future like job interviews that I have. And now I also have connections with those professors and other students from my program in New Zealand now. Yeah, I know I'm um, going on exchange. I definitely feel like this has helped me um, figure out what I would like to do um, further in my psychology degree. Um, I took a really interesting course out there, human behavior in extreme environments, and it got me really more interested in psychology than I was. So going on exchange, one of the benefits is that you can take courses like you wouldn't be able to take at home. Um, and we just have a question in the chat. Um, so after living in New Zealand for a shorter period of time, would you consider living there permanently, Emily? Definitely. Um, I was uh, talking to my parents very frequently while I was there and I was like Snapchatting my friends all the time. And my one, my best friend from home, I was Snapchatting her so frequently. I'm like, this is it. Like, I'm not coming home. I'm staying here. And I had to actually stop saying it because she would just start like crying because I was so like set on staying there. And she was like, no, like you have to come home. Um, so yeah, I, I'm definitely planning on going back. And if the opportunity arises that I can live there for an extended period of time, I definitely would take up that opportunity. Yeah, I feel that with um, Australia as well. I didn't actually come home early with COVID, but I was still like stuck. I was wanting to stay. I was so sad when I was leaving, um, but with, with COVID, I wasn't able to leave Tasmania and go to mainland Australia. So I would definitely like to go back and travel around there or do another study abroad program somewhere on the mainland. Um, so now that we've been talking a lot about New Zealand and about your exchange, what was your favorite memory um, on your exchange in New Zealand? Um. I have a few. So like the first thing that jumps out on me was um, one weekend we went to Kaikoura and we went um, kayaking on the ocean with a bunch of the New Zealand fur seals. So it's um, it was really cool to go to Kaikoura and just see all the seals everywhere sleeping on the rocks and um, just everywhere. And then it was awesome to get out on the ocean and then approach them that way. Um, that's actually the better way to approach them because um, they're not as stressed when they're in the water. So it was really cool just to learn more about them and then get up close. So I have like videos from like in the kayak of like the seals like swimming around in the water and playing, which was just amazing. Um, I have a new obsession with seals that I didn't know I had before. Um, mm -hmm. And then just being uh, in the school there, uh, Lincoln was a very, very small school. Um, so like my largest class was like 100, 150 people. Um, and the prof was like, stop telling people to take this class. Like there are too many people, it's too big. Um, so it's just a difference with the class sizes there, how small it was. And you really got to know all of your profs. Um, my Maori studies prof, uh, we'd talk to after class and he'd give us recommendations of places to go visit on the weekend, restaurants to go to. Um, so it's just a really like, nice, close, like tight knit community. And everyone there wanted to help you and make sure you had the best time there that you could, which was awesome. Mm. Yeah, I know it's it's always so hard to pick like what's your favorite memory from there. Like every single day you get to experience something new. You get to try something. I know I knocked so much off my bucket list there. Mm -hmm. Um, So how was the the process for applying? Like what um, supports did the CIP office like office offer you? Um, trying to think back. <laughs> it feels like forever ago. Um, so going through with like CIP. Um, there's the information sessions that we had to attend and then there's like the specific ones uh, for the BLA program that I attended. Um, and then the website had a lot of information and there's always those resources that you could reach out to um, if you had any questions that were able to provide you with support. And then once I got accepted, um, there's other processes that you had to follow through to make sure you get everything documented to go. And then when I went, I was still getting emails from Mike, just like checking in, making sure everything was good. So I always felt very supported and that there was always someone there if I ever needed to reach out for anything. Yeah, I know um, the CIP office was so supportive and helpful with my many questions when I was applying. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in studying abroad, you will email the CIP to attend an info session, which you can do those modules on the course link. 
Um, and then the applications to study abroad, um, they open up in December. So for this process, you pick your top five choices. Um, so you can pick those all over the world with any of our options. I know I was set on going to Australia, so my top three options, I'm pretty sure, were Tasmania, Sydney, Melbourne, and then New Zealand. I think it had Wales in there, so you can have many choices. And we do try our best to get students placed in their top choice. Um, it all depends on how many people apply, how many spots are available. Um, and then so this is due January 29th for the year 2021. So that's um, summer 21, fall 21 and winter 22. Um, and then so I know things with COVID, um, it feels a little bit different but we are still going through with the application process in hopes that things will be getting better and that study abroad opportunities will continue in the future. So don't let the current situation discourage anybody from the application process. We continue to monitor the situation from the Government of Canada and the University of Guelph perspective, and student safety is always our top priority. Um, so um, is there any more questions from any of our attendees? Any comments, concerns? We have a question from somebody in the audience that says, what if you don't have a top five choices? Like say you only have three. So I'll actually take this one and answer it. Um, so if we recommend that students apply to all five options or list five options because it'll give you the greatest uh, possibility of being placed somewhere. If you only have three choices, you can just put three choices. Um, but like I said, if we can't place you in those top three choices, then we don't have more options to consider. So all giving us all five options will be your best option, best choice. Yeah, I know um, I first um, was very interested in Australia, so I only wanted to put down Australian options. But then once I started doing more research, I was like, oh my goodness, how do I pick five? Like I had wanted to go to so many places um, but if there's not any more questions in the chat, I'll just cover some more general information really quick before we wrap up. We have lots of um, frequently asked questions about the COVID-19 situation on our website. You also can watch previous Explore sessions, which are recorded. Um, and you can also virtually explore these regions on the website through movies, documentaries, books, arts and culture. Um, oh, I think we do have um, one more question. Um, can you study abroad during grad school or is it only undergrad? Jacqueline, did you want to answer this one or would you like me to? Sure, I can answer it. So uh, you do have the possibility to study abroad during grad school. I think most students are usually undergrads when they participate. But that doesn't mean it's not an option. So when you're looking through our program search tool, you can pick the program that you're in and then also distinguish if you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student. I think your options are maybe a little bit more limited and you might have to do a little bit more work beforehand to organize it all, but it is still definitely an option for you. Yeah, I know after um, studying abroad during my undergraduate degree, I definitely want to look into going abroad during my graduate degree. Um, it's definitely something I'd like to incorporate into my future. Um, but so if you are interested in studying abroad, just a reminder, we do have our study abroad fair next week. Um, lots of information is on the website for that. So that is at uoguelph.ca slash VIP. And you can find the schedule, the events that we are having, and lots of information over there. And next week, the information session that is happening is the Global South, um, which will again will be at 2.30 to 3.30. So hopefully we see you either at that session or at the study broad fair. If you have any more questions or like to book a, a virtual one-on-one -on -one appointment, feel free to reach out to the office at cip at uoguelph.ca. And thanks for attending the session, everyone. I hope you all have a great rest of your week.
Mm-hmm. 